Hi guys, welcome back to Matt Chat. This is episode number 29, covering one of the best and earliest computer role-playing games ever made, Surtex Wizardry, The Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. <laughs> Surtex Wizardry, uh, created by Robert uh, Woodhead and Andrew uh, C. Greenberg, is uh, one of the best uh, computer role-playing games of the early 80s. It was a uh, very influential. Uh, we'll see this game's inspiration in later hits like uh, The Bard's Tale and Wasteland and, and many others. It was uh, highly innovative and uh, unlike so many games from this period, uh, Wizardry is still pretty easy to pick up and play today. It's still a very, very playable game and I think that really says something about the way uh, this game was put together and its interface. <laughs> There's a reason it was uh, so influential. Um, although uh, Wizardry, the series, is probably not as well known today as uh, uh, Lord British or uh, Richard Garriott's Ultima series, uh, which also debuted around this time, I, I still think it's a very important series and uh, well worth uh, our time today. Just to give you some uh, comparisons of what else you could be playing if you were into uh, Dungeons & Dragons uh, games in the uh, early 80s, uh, besides uh, Calabeth uh, World of Doom, uh, that was, of course, uh, Richard Garriott's uh, first uh, computer role-playing game that was uh, published. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not a bad game, but, it, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, you can tell this, he was just getting uh, started with his uh, programming skills. Uh, there was also a series called Dungeon Quest, or Dungeon Quest, uh, Temple of Apshai uh, being the first game in that series. And that was published by Automated Simulations, who uh, later became uh, Epics, of course, and published some of the best games ever uh, for the Commodore 64 platform. Uh, but Wizardry, uh, I think, stands apart from these games. Uh, I tried playing um, a Calabath, I tried playing a Dungeon Quest, and uh, these games, they just didn't have the same appeal to me as Wizardry, and I think you're going to uh, like it too. Anyway, there's a lot to this game, uh, so let's get started. See you at the edge of town. Like most computer role-playing games, uh, Wizardry begins with a character creation sequence, but unlike most games, um, then and now, instead of creating one, you must create six different characters. Uh, you, of course, give them a name. Uh, the password feature is basically there in case you wanted to play this uh, with uh, multiple players. Each could have a password to prevent uh, someone else from tampering with their character while they were away. Uh, race is uh, ranges from elf, dwarf, hobbit, uh, gnome, uh, the usual uh, races in games like this. Uh, they have bonuses like the elf has a higher IQ and so on. Um, the rest of these uh, statistics should be pretty obvious to you if you've played any Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, strength, of course, is a uh, prerequisite for warriors, uh, IQ for wizards, and uh, so on. Uh, a few other things to consider are alignment. Uh, there are certain um, alignment um, incompatibilities. Uh, for instance, you can't have a good thief. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, so you can only pick neutral or evil. And then uh, later on there will be some prestige classes such as the ninja uh, that you won't be able to select if you're good. Um, and uh, vice versa for some that require that you be good, uh, like the Lord. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of interesting uh, long-term effects of these uh, choices that you make uh, right at the beginning of the game. Uh, the typical party it will consist of two fighters, uh, one cleric, one thief, and two mages. Once you've created your characters and gone to Baltac's uh, trading post to buy some equipment for them, uh, then you enter these, this uh, really cool uh, dungeon. And this is, should be recognizable to you if you ever played Pool of Radiance. Uh, that was my first video, by the way, if you haven't seen that. And uh, uh, The Bard's Tale, a, a game from the mid-80s. And here we have encountered a monster, and you'll notice that the uh, maze was replaced with a close-up of the monster. Uh, these are in color, but not animated. And I get to assign each of my six characters a command. I can have them fight, cast spells. Only the characters in the first three... Uh, one through three there can uh, actually fight the monsters hand to hand. Uh, the guys in the back are limited to spells. So obviously put your wizards in the back. Of course the advantage of that is they, they can't get hit either. Uh, so you can focus your armor on your 
first three characters. Uh, most of these battles tend to go pretty quick, especially at the beginning of the game. Uh, it is very possible to get killed if you run into a, a, a formidable group. Uh, fortunately, you can run away. But the idea, at least at the start of the game, is to explore, uh, kill some monsters, get some experience. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, here I found a chest, and this is where my thief will, of course, come in handy. Uh, I've identified the trap, managed to disarm it, and I get some treasure. Just like the tabletop version of this uh, Dun Dungeons & Dragons, each of these uh, different classes has their uses um, and will be needed in the game. Uh, the mages are, work like your artillery. Uh, they, it's actually a pretty interesting magic system. It's, it's sort of based on the old slot system of uh, memorizing spells. You only get uh, so many spells uh, that you can cast before you have to rest to replenish. Um, however, you can cast any of the spells that you have in your spell book um, as long as you have an available slot. Now, that's a little different than in uh, games like Pool of Radiance where you have to specifically memorize each spell. And uh, the way you learn spells uh, seems to be random. I don't know if there's more to this, but I noticed as I leveled up my mage, that, uh, mages, they would learn at seem seemingly at random uh, different spells in their level, uh, which is kind of a problem. Uh, for some of the really important spells like uh, Duma Pick or Duma Pick uh, that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so it's definitely worthwhile to have two mages to uh, double your chances of getting those uh, really useful spells. Uh, of course, the priest also has spells uh, focused mainly on uh, uh, healing and uh, power power ups for your other characters. So everybody has a specific need. Maybe the uh, thief is uh, the one that you might think about replacing or. Uh, you can also change classes of your characters later. Um, I know one of the strategies I, I heard about was um, changing the thief into something else as soon as possible uh, just to free up that slot. Uh, just to skip it ahead a bit here, I wanted to show how you can get attacked by uh, more than one group of creature. Uh, sometimes uh, these uh, creatures are at a distance, so you can throw some stuff at them before they get to you, uh, which is pretty nice. Also, when you get confronted with really large groups, uh, that's where your mages really start to shine because they have uh, spells that can affect whole groups of creatures uh, putting them all to sleep or uh, possibly even just uh, killing them all in uh, one <laughs> with one spell. It's uh, pretty cool. There's quite a bit of uh, diversity of spells in this game as well including spells that even damage uh, the caster as a, a side effect so a really good variety some uh, real creativity there. Now, unlike uh, so many modern games, and this might seem really strange to you, uh, one of the appeals of this game uh, was mapping out these dungeons. Uh, people who were serious about this game would buy graph paper. Uh, you could also, there was uh, some of the versions even included some uh, special graph paper. Uh, for mapping out these dungeons, and uh, there are also certain spells like uh, this Dumapic uh, that I'm showing you. So if you manage to get turned around, you can cast this spell and get a pretty good idea of where you are in the dungeon. Uh, that was a seems a weird today. Uh, of course, games have auto maps and such as that now. Uh, but it's one of the big appeals of this game. What we're looking at here is the Commodore 64 version of the game, which is actually the version I played uh, back when I was a kid. And as you can see, uh, the graphics are a little improved. The interface is streamlined. Uh, you can now just hit Enter and to uh, sort of hit the commands in battle that are used most frequently. A lot of nice touches. Uh, the only downside of this version is uh, you will be waiting uh, for the load times. And here is the Nintendo Entertainment System version, which is many people's favorite. Uh, this is actually pretty popular on the Nintendo. Uh, it has a lot of music, a lot better graphics. Uh, the interface is really, really streamlined, works well with the controller. Uh, this is probably the version I would recommend uh, to new players. And incidentally, Wizardry is one of the few uh, American games that was uh, popular in Japan. Uh, there's, you can see the influence of this game on uh, games such as uh, Dragon Quest, uh, for instance. And that's all for this week's Match Chat. I do have a bit, a bit of an announcement. I'm having a new contest. Uh, some of you said that you were a little disappointed that you didn't win the uh, bookmarks uh, from the contest we had a while back. So, brand new contest. Uh, so the prizes are a Vintage Games and a Dungeons and Desktop. A sign bookmark and I'm giving those to the first five people who make video responses uh, to this or any of my other videos. Uh, just uh, make sure I know about the response and then shoot me your mailing address and I'll happily get those to you. 
Um, as always, if you like this video, please rate it, comment on it, uh, let your friends know. I really appreciate that. Well, I'll catch you later. I'm off to Gilgamesh's Tavern.